I've spent enough time talking to you now <laughs> that like I can preemptively say, just avoid the whole you saying, well, that depends. If we're talking about on humans, then it's just gonna be on land because in the sea, there's, there's a whole other ball game. The sharks, I'm Rick Garner. A memoir. <laughs> Welcome back to Nature League. It's the fourth week of the month, and that means it's time for the segment called From A to B, where my friend Adrian Adams asks me, Britt Garner, a question about the natural world or life on Earth. Now, speaking of life on Earth, this month is all about not life on Earth. <laughs> I know! It's about extinction. Yes. So we've been talking about the process of extinction, what happens in mass extinction events. We've dug into the scientific literature, we did a field trip, all that good stuff. So now that leaves you asking me something that's been on your mind having to do with this theme. So, Adrian, what do you got? So, when humans inevitably all just die off, what species that is currently on the planet do you think will take the human's place as the dominant life form on land? Why are humans dominant? For you, like, what's your definition? Because we can manipulate the land okay. more efficiently and basically do literally anything we want to the land. We have built cities. We have multiplied more exponentially than any other animal in know. history. The human population on this planet has doubled since 1970. When Thanos snaps his fingers, we go back to the 70s. Who That's that? Thanos? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know who Thanos is? Sounds Greek. This is our friendship. <laughs> I'm just saying, think of it like this. If somebody snapped his finger, if he had, say, an infinity gauntlet, mm -hmm. and he snapped his finger, and half of all humans on the planet were to just turn into dust, mm -hmm. one of them would go, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good. That we... one's Iron Man. <laughs> then that would just take us back to the 70s. There is no other creature on this planet that has done that, whose population has done that. It, I, I mean, Bacteria do it way faster and all the time. I'm saying you can't but, use but, exponential growth as but, a qualifier. But, but not just that. It's like humans, if they wanted to, mm -hmm. could kill off mm -hmm. every other animal on the planet and um, have next to no problem doing so. We are the apex predator. Okay. Period. Okay. Apex predator versus dominant species versus reproductive capacity versus building cities. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of ways that we can define dominance. So building but cities But I would say is, that all of those factor into one thing. It is this large umbrella that humans can do all of these things. Do you think that there is a species currently on this planet that could take our place and do all of these things? I mean, ants? Plants, plant biomass, terrestrial plant biomass, just like how much there is, you know, by, by like weight. There's way more than terrestrial animals and they completely affect the climate. They're basically doing the regulation of both like carbon dioxide and oxygen. If you think back to the like creation of the atmosphere, that was things like cyanobacteria. I mean, they radically shaped the entire atmosphere. Yeah, but they weren't, they weren't like planning it out. They weren't like, you know what we're gonna do to the atmosphere. We're gonna kill everything with oxygen. I don't, I don't know oxygen. what they did. I don't know what they did. They killed everything with oxygen. They killed everything with oxygen? Well, they created it and then everything, but it was like, haven't done this yet. So shaping, truly manipulating, shaping the earth. I think there's an argument to be made that a species that can radically change the atmosphere is a prob probably a pretty good contender. So like we've radically changed the atmosphere in terms of uh, releasing greenhouse gases and so then that has created a long-term warming trend mm -hmm. but again cyanobacteria with oxygen in the atmosphere or if you look at trees and them pumping oxygen sure. and changing things okay so all humans just we all just fall down right now and we all just die mm -hmm. who's going to climb into the ruins of our civilization and look through all of our stuff you and know. then however many millions of years in the future will have museums dedicated to our civilization. I don't think museums is a qualifier for dominant species. But you see what I'm saying? You're talking about Is Planet of the Apes going to happen? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> that's basically the gist I'm getting. I'm not asking if specifically apes are going to rise up and take our place mm -hmm. as the dominant life form. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking... If apes are gonna <laughs> like, rise uh, and yeah. take our place as the dominant yeah, life form? but like, do you think ants would learn to walk on two legs and 
Uh, communicate in different ways. And My answer w was going to be ants, by the way. Uh, hands down. You think about how many there are and the fact that they affect, I mean, every single piece of the terrestrial biome that they touch. I mean, a third of grass on Earth will be like manipulated and, and processed in some way by insects. And that's just insects, right? Think about invertebrates are like 95% of life on Earth. Argentine ants, those super colonies. Yeah, I love super colonies. I know. Tell me about some super colonies. I mean, that is absolutely remarkable and they're leaving i mean if you think like ant hills and the way that they're breaking things down and communication like being able to do chemical trails doing all kinds of things like how is that not dominant so i guess i'm trying to point out that dominance is different than super success right like just just totally kick all right ass. so let's take the word dominance and success out of here yeah i'm asking if there is gonna be an animal that does what humans do that is a different question and a fair one so I think that because so many either random chance of like random changes from mutation or, you know, selected changes because of environmental pressure, so much had to happen to get us to right here that to say that it could just happen again in the same way is is it seems almost impossible, right? Whereas different selective pressure can lead to amazing different traits and, mm -hmm. and things and, and adaptations, but it doesn't have to look like humans. I mean, for all we know, like this was just, dear God, a total chance mixed with selection that got to this whole standing on two legs and doing the brain thing, right? And by brain thing, I, I, I mean- No, I know what you mean. Yeah, but I know it, it felt, it felt uh, pretty broad. <laughs> oh, I, the brain thing. For right. once I, you know, you put it in the simplest terms and it's like, Click. Oh yeah, the brain thing. I'm here for you. Thanks. Yeah. So I think it'd be unfair to say what's the next human because there isn't the next human. Think about the mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. It wasn't that after mass extinction, a species rose up to be exactly in that same place or occupying the same kind of function or even features as the things before it. No, it just keeps moving forward as chance and selection. Evolution is just it, just continuing. So like you never saw after a mass extinction, like, oh, and we got everything back and it looks just the same, right? Like it's amazing that we're here, but it was because things that died off before us were probably super different. And so when I think about dominance, I think about, you know, you could think about numbers, you could think of impact, like how much are, is the world or like the earth itself being impacted? And that's why I mentioned something like trees or cyanobacteria, but I don't know that we get this again, right? Like this form or this working piece. And with cities, you mentioned building cities, life on earth builds habitat all the time. And when I think about like, let's say all the humans are gone right now, dude, raccoons are gonna have a field day. Can you imagine all the buildings and things? I mean, it just becomes infrastructure. Yeah, there's not trash anymore for them to dig through, but it's still structure. Like things will live in our structures. Absolutely. Do you think it would be manipulators, environmental manipulators that would because there's so much left behind mm -hmm. when humans pass off. Right. There's so much left behind that maybe there would be an evolutionary advantage to the creatures that could figure out how to use them the fastest. The creature that realizes that, hey, this is a bicycle. The, these are wheels. Look at these wheel things that move, you know? And it's the things that can manipulate. So maybe raccoons yeah. could figure it out. That'd be cool. Like basically urban exploiters yeah which, which yes you could Ooh. argue you could argue that some of that is availability of food so all the humans are gone you don't get the trash and the and the food and, and that kind of stuff but you do still have these incredible structures right we call them buildings but it's basically just habitat and, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point those that are thriving within that system potentially just have kind of a free ride Almost like you are you don't have to pay rent and the house is just built for you and then you go for oh, it. Oh, so it's possible that they'll stop evolving simply because they they don't have to anymore? Evolution doesn't stop. You don't stop evolving. But but, but when you are really well suited for an environment, you will not necessarily You become a specialist. Much. You become um, a specialist. You could, though urban exploiters are more generalist, right? They do well in human-created habitats and raccoons would do fine anywhere, basically, right? Gotta love trash pandas. It's true. So I think that because, you mentioned, because we have altered the landscape so much, it makes sense that the next successful rise of things would be something that could use all that stuff we built and erected all over the landscape. Like, right. So, I mean, that's one thought, right? Mm. But, you know, there's, there's also the, the, the sheer number. There's also the sheer number. Seven, seven billion people, 
seven plus billion people, it's not that amazing. Like, but considering there's trillions. But of considering other that only fifty years ago we were half that number. That's impressive. But it's not though. Think about how long we have to wait, like oh, quite a long time before we can even reproduce. You you cannot compare that to like bacteria or other invertebrates. So basically what you're telling me is that I have permission to no. write a comic no. book. No, whatever you say where next. All no. urban exploiters no. live in a post-apocalyptic earth. Nothing but like urban exploiters have taken over. So we're talking raccoons. Mm -hmm. North American possums. Deer, white-tailed deer, rock that. Sure, white-tailed deer, uh, rats, mm -hmm. squirrels, mm -hmm. all these fun things. And they're all walking around and they've got like rocket launchers and it's like Mad Max. This is why gun safes exist, so that the squirrels cannot get access to your weaponry after the apocalypse. Just saying, I'm just saying. Safety is sexy. Basically, there's a lot of ways you can define dominance and when you think about each of the different ways, you might come up with a species that potentially is gonna kind of take the lead. But at the same time, you know there's an option where a species doesn't necessarily take the lead and everything is just kind of living in its own place. So honestly, who knows? I suppose if you were to look back however many millions and millions of years and look at, you know, those early, early mammals and, you know, a dinosaur were to say, hey, you know, Hypothetically speaking, if a meteor came and we just like all died, which one of these organisms do you think would take our place? You know, they're thinking in too narrow a scope yeah. to really guess that it would have been the mammals. And honestly, you could go back to each one of those mass extinction events and probably get that guess wrong if you were at the, the mm -hmm. time of it. Because life on Earth is, is amazing and complex and, and random at times, and that's just a very, very cool thing. Life finds a way. You forgot. Ba -da 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 -da. You forgot the uh. Life finds a way. Uh. No. Uh. Thank you very much. This has been an episode of From A to B. We're super stoked that, why don't you do this? Why are you doing the outro? I thought it'd be fun. Thank you for joining us for this extinctions themed From A to B episode. I uh, quite enjoyed myself in a similar way to the way that life uh, finds a way. In a, uh, similar way than uh, life uh, finds a way. I know that I've learned something. Have you learned something? I've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. Hopefully you've learned a lot as well. And uh, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.